Where are you going to go for lunch specials? Um, just the shepherd's pie. Shepherd's pie sounds great. Oh, over. Salmon burgers, sounds good. I really like these burgers. Here? Yeah, it is. It's really good. I have a lot of them. Here. 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 I guess I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, Dean's photo. Uh, 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 this is Dean's photo. 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 This is Dean's Fresh water right here. And I'm not a teacher, so I'm so much Yeah, Pints and politics. Thank you. Yes. Welcome back here in Hampshire. Now, one guy in 1450s, I'm Chris Ryan. Thanks for joining us for Pints and Politics here at the Barley House, fueled by the Smutty Nose Brewing Company. I'm going to be joined right now on the program by Dr. Ben Carson, conservative thought leader individual who has uh, risen to great prominence uh, within the political system despite the fact that he has never achieved elective office, best-selling author and individual who has uh, the respect of uh, Republican primary voters across the country. Dr. Carson, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. really appreciate you joining us uh, for the program. And we'll start off with, you know, where you see your campaign right now. As I mentioned, you know, this is the first time you've done something like this in a presidential campaign. It's expansive. Sure. It's difficult. Uh, you've had ups and downs in terms of the process aspect of things, developing a staff. Where do you see your campaign? What have been the challenges of, of being a first-time presidential candidate, first-time candidate for office? Well, actually, things have gone amazingly well. Uh, we've uh, quickly acquired extremely talented people. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, the Washington Post said our, our candidacy was in turmoil which is just a total, complete, utter lie. Mm -hmm. And the people that they said who had left, you know, contacted them, said, there's a reason that we left, so that we can do another part of the thing. Why don't you tell that story? Mm -hmm. and they, no, they want, their narrative wants to be that we're having difficulty. They said we'd never be able to raise money, but uh, obviously the money is coming in. Uh, over 150,000 unique donors, over 200,000 donations. Uh, we have plenty of money to take care of our problems. Um, so I see our, our candidacy as a juggernaut. It's just moving uh, extremely rapidly, extremely well. Uh, we're in the top tier in virtually every poll. Uh, and people are waking up across the nation. That's what's so, so cool. Everywhere we go, red states, blue states, north, south, east, west, you know, very large enthusiastic crowds of people who are learning to think for themselves rather than have some political pundit tell you what you're supposed to think. This is the accepted way of doing things, they tell you. These are the accepted candidates. The problem is the accepted candidates have got us into all this problem. And uh, it's time for us to actually solve these problems. And it's time for us to return the people to the pinnacle of power in this country rather than the government. I think that a lot of people share that view. And I think that a lot of individuals feel that politicians got us into the mess. But taking the step of voting for or supporting an individual who does not have any elected experience, to, to borrow from you know, what, what you do, it would be essentially like me going into you know, the operating room and saying, hey, I know a lot about this, and actually, I have good ideas. But, but actually, go ahead. Actually, it wouldn't be, because I could take a smart person off the street here, mm -hmm. and I could give them a year of training in politics, and they could do a pretty good job. But could they be I, president of the United States? I give them a year of training in uh, neurosurgery, and they would know nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and really what you need in order to lead a country like this, because our country was designed for citizen leaders, for statesmen, not for a permanent class of politicians. And what you really need to know is how our nation is supposed to work. What you need to know is how the Constitution works, not what all the intricacies 
of the inefficient system is that we have now with all the different liaisons with special interest groups. I don't need to know that. I don't want to know that, quite frankly. I want to know how it's supposed to work and want to get it back to that. Now, I realize you do need to know, have people around you who've been in to the mire and knows how all that stuff goes yeah. and knows the history of it. I do recognize that. Um, but the Bible says, in the multitude of counselors is safety. Mm -hmm. um, but the key thing is you got to have a vision because the Bible also says without a vision that people perish. And we're in the process of perishing right now as we throw away all of our values and principles for the sake of political correctness. So the key in your view is having individuals around you who know how to play the game, but for you to have you know, the, the wherewithal to know as an individual citizen um, and to to be able to put and their constitutional knowledge, to be able to push forth that actual role. What are the examples of individuals who you'd like to you know, have around you? And how would you construct a, a an administration? What would be the types of individuals that you would want around you? Not just naming people in particular, but how would you go about well, putting together an administration? I want people who have a great deal of experience. For instance, you know, there are, are uh, generals that I talk to on a regular basis. Uh, who have a great deal of knowledge about, you know, what's been going on in the Middle East, uh, a great deal of knowledge about Eastern Europe and what's been going on there. And we've had a lot of in-depth conversations, which has brought me up to speed tremendously on what's going on in the world. And, you know, I always thought I knew a lot, but there's a lot more. The more you know, the less you know. Right. <laughs> in life, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, do you finish? I don't want to cut you off. Well, well no, 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 I'm also going to say, you know, in terms of, of economics, uh, in terms of business, I think we need to run our government more like a business. And, you know, I've had decades of experience on corporate boards and learning how both national and international business works. But I've also come to know that there are people who are total geniuses in that area. Those are the kind of people that I want advising me on economic policy as opposed to, you know, a lot of people who have no real experience in the world. They may be a, a university professor and have lived in an ivy tower, but they don't know how the real world works. Uh, Dr. Carson, I think what, what uh, Chris is alluding to is the idea that it's been decades since we've had somebody with no political experience win the presidency. And so, um, since and I can't... Those individuals I, were yeah, generals. Yes, and so I can't look at your record as governor and see how you interacted with the state legislature or in Congress. So maybe at least you can give us a, a little bit of a glimpse of, of your philosophy, kind of on the ground. How would you deal with Congress? and the possibility you may at some point have a, a chamber controlled by the other party. Kind of, What's your sort of philosophy as an executive? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, just because you don't have government experience doesn't mean you don't have experience. Um, you know, I have uh, spent many decades as a neurosurgeon solving very complex problems, some of which have never been solved by anybody in the history of the world. Uh, that takes a lot of know-how and to be able to put the teams together to do that. Uh, like I said, I've had decades of experience in the corporate world. Uh, my wife and I started a national nonprofit, the Carson Scholars Fund. As you know, nine out of ten nonprofits fail. Ours is active in all 50 states, doing very well. Has won the Simon Award, which is only given to one nonprofit in the country out of thousands. Uh, comes with a check for $250,000. The Ronald McDonald Charity Award, only one organization out of thousands has won that, another six-figure check, and others too, but we don't do it for the for the awards, we do it uh, for the effect. Teachers have told us when we put a scholar in their classroom, the whole the classroom improves, the GPA of the whole class goes up. So it's really more about knowing how to do things than it is having a long political pedigree. Sure, but, but what would be your philosophy? You know, there are some presidents who they have an agenda and they want to push it through Congress. There are others who prefer to have kind of Congress sort of kick around some ideas and bring something to them. I mean, specifically now, you, you no, know, I, your experience is a given, but specifically at Congress, sort of what is your philosophy on governing with that branch? I think you have to lead. And, you know, Congress, we've sent a lot of people to Congress in the last few elections. Uh, who had, who said the right things and seemed to have the right philosophy, but as we see, Congress is largely a peanut gallery, uh, which is watching what the Supreme Court does and watching what the executive branch does. Um, 
and that's because uh, the strong leadership has not been there. I think that can come from the executive office. From the executive office, Congress is really the only branch of government which has the ability uh, to make law, uh, and yet they've allowed that to be usurped uh, by others. They do have the ability to pass laws to check anything that's been done by the executive branch or by the Supreme Court. And for instance, I would be encouraging them right now if I was sitting in the executive office to make sure that they pass laws that protect the religious liberty of American citizens. There is no American citizen who should have to lose their job or lose their business uh, because of their faith. And Congress only has the ability to do that. Jamie? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Carson, thanks for being here. Uh, earlier uh, at the uh, intro of the show, uh, we were uh, discussing among the three of us um, who the Ben Carson voter is. And uh, I was curious as to uh, who you believe the Ben Carson voter is in this election. Well, I can tell you, uh, every place I go, I run into a lot of people who say, I've never voted before. Uh, I never got registered to vote before, and I'm voting for you. They don't know <laughs> what category they belong in, except they belong in the category of an American, of somebody who understands that our country is going off the deep end, that we're giving away all of our values and principles for the sake of political correctness, that we're losing our vision of who we are. And uh, so I, I think the Ben Carson voter are the people who actually recognize that we're going to have to change course, and we can't just play around the edges. We're going to have to go through the heart of the matter here. In the, in the next segment of the show, we'll talk about some of the issues that are significant here in New Hampshire and where you stand on those and get a feel for you know what that agenda would be as President of the United States. But in, in concluding this first segment of the show, Dr. Ben Carson here at Pines of Politics at Parley House, I wanted to you tell us a little about yourself. And you know, obviously everybody knows the, the political aspect of things. They see you on Fox, they've read the books. But outside of what the public persona is of Ben Carson, what would you want to share with individuals um, about who you are a, as a person? Well, as a person, I'm, I'm someone who went into medicine because as an eight-year-old, I was inspired by mission stories, by these missionary doctors who traveled all over the world at great personal expense to bring not only physical but mental and spiritual healing to people, and they seem like the most noble people on the face of the earth. Uh, later on, as a teenager, I decided I'd rather be rich. So <laughs> at that point, I said, I think I'll be a psychiatrist. And then uh, later on, I said, well, what are you really good at? And I started analyzing my life, and I realized I had a lot of eye-hand coordination, the ability to think in three dimensions. I was a very careful person, never knocked things over and said, oops which is a great characteristic for brain surgeons. So, you know, <laughs> all of those things make me decide that maybe that was where I should go. You left that out of the application. <laughs> and a lot of people thought it was strange because at the time I decided that, there were eight black neurosurgeons, or had ever been eight black neurosurgeons in the history of the world. But, you know, that didn't bother me at all because I said, this is where your talent is, and that's where you have to go. And, uh, it, I'm a person who believes you sort of go through the doors that are open based on the talents that you have. And, you know, my plan was to relax after a very arduous neurosurgical career, 15,000 operations, um, and have a traditional retirement. But, uh, you know, doors began to open. People began to clamor for me to do this. I really thought it would all die down, but it never did, and it continued to build up. And, and as I had a chance to talk to Americans across this country and see how helpless they felt and how they were hurting, and uh, you know, I do realize that I've been given you know a certain talent for solving problems, um, and I also am going to utilize the talents of a lot of people around me to get those problems solved because that's one of the strengths of America. That's Dr. Ben Carson here at Pines of Politics here at the Barley House, one of the 9, 14, 15, Concord News Radio.com. Pines of Politics, fueled by the Smutty Nose Brewing Company. We'll come back and talk some issues with uh, Senator Carson after we'll talk some issues with Dr. Carson after this. <laughs> Sorry, ben, we, can edit, we can edit out all my mistakes. <laughs> all right, uh, here we go with the second sentence.
Welcome back here at the Pints of Politics in the Barley House, 1 to 9, 1450, and ConcordNewsRadio.com. Pints of Politics fueled by this Money Knows Brewing Company, Dr. Ben Carson, a renowned neurosurgeon, joins us here for uh, the program. And I'm interested, you brought this up previous in talking about re uh, religious equality. And we're at a time in our nation where, um, you know, we just celebrated the 4th of July, and this is a country that was in my view, founded uh, upon freedom for all individuals to pursue their uh, their life, their lifestyles, and to um, and to do so without government intervention. I'm curious as to your thoughts as to where we sit right now here in 2015 in regards to racial equality, um, equality in regards to uh, immigrants, illegal or non-legal uh, uh, immigrants, um, religious equality, um, and sexual equality. Where do you think this, this nation sits, and, and where w would it be under your presidency? Well, I think we've made tremendous progress uh, up until recently. Uh, I believe the purveyors of division have done a masterful job in terms of making the American people into each other's enemies, uh, creating a non-existent war on women, using every incident that involves people of two different races to stoke the fires of, of racial division, uh, class warfare, always keeping that on the front burner, um, religious uh, intolerance, and uh, even creating wedges between people of different generations. Um, that's going to require the right kind of leadership. Uh, now, admittedly, um, our president currently was a community organizer. What do the community organizers do? We got to get ours as us against them. That's what they do. So none of that should be surprising to us. But you know that's not who we are as a nation. Uh, our strength has always been in our unity. And uh, I would be someone who really emphasized what we have in common rather than what we have apart. It's okay for people to disagree about things. That doesn't make them enemies. Uh, we need to learn how to have intelligent discussions put things on the table, a lot of times you'll discover that you're not as far apart as you think you are. 